Rahula Pali and Sanskrit was the only son of Siddhartha Gautama commonly known as the Buddha c. 563 or 480 to 483 or 400 BCE, and his wife and princess Yasodhara. He is mentioned in numerous Buddhist texts, from the early period onward. Accounts about Rahula indicate a mutual impact between Prince Siddhartha's life and those of his family members. According to the Pali tradition, Rahula is born on the day of Prince Siddhartha's renunciation, and is therefore named Rahula, meaning a fetter on the path to enlightenment. According to the Mulasarvastivada tradition, and numerous other later sources, however, Rahula is only conceived on the day of Prince Siddhartha, and is born six years later, when Prince Siddhartha becomes enlightened as the Buddha. This long gestation period is explained by bad karma from previous lives of both Yasodhara and of Rahula himself, although more naturalistic reasons are also given. As a result of the late birth, Yasodhara needs to prove that Rahula is really Prince Siddhartha's son, which she eventually does successfully by an act of truth. Historian Wolfgang Schumann has argued that Prince Siddhartha conceived Rahula and waited for his birth, to be able to leave the palace with the king and queen's permission, but Orientalist Noel Perry considered it more likely that Rahula was born after Prince Siddhartha left his palace. Between 7 and 15 years after Rahula is born, the Buddha returns to his hometown, where Yasodhara has Rahula ask the Buddha for the throne of the Sakya clan. The Buddha responds by having Rahula ordain as the first Buddhist novice monk. He teaches the young novice about truth, self-reflection, and not self, eventually leading to Rahula's enlightenment. Although early accounts state that Rahula dies before the Buddha does, later tradition has it that Rahula is one of the disciples that outlives the Buddha, guarding the Buddha's dispensation until the rising of the next Buddha. Rahula is known in Buddhist texts for his eagerness for learning, and was honored by novice monks and nuns throughout Buddhist history. His accounts have led to a perspective in Buddhism of seeing children as hindrances to the spiritual life on the one hand, and as people with potential for enlightenment on the other hand. Topic. Accounts Some early texts such as those of the Pali tradition do not mention Rahula at all, but he is mentioned in later Pali texts such as the Apadana and the Commentaries, as well as in the texts on monastic discipline of the Mulasarvastivada and Mahasangika traditions. Earliest texts do not describe Rahula in much detail, and he remains an ideal figure without much depth in character. Because of the lack of detail, especially after Rahula's ordination, some scholars have argued Rahula did not have an important role in Buddhism. Apart from the early texts, there are many post-canonical Buddhist texts that contain accounts about Rahula. The accounts about Rahula reveal that when Prince Siddhartha leaves his palace to become a monk, his decision and subsequent spiritual quest is not just a personal matter, but also affects his family every step during the way, as they respond to and affect the prince on his path to enlightenment. Thus, the prince's life before enlightenment is about two parallel spiritual lives, that of the Buddha and that of his family. Birth Pali tradition Rahula is born on same day Prince Siddhartha Gautama renounces the throne by leaving the palace, when the prince is 29 years old, on the full moon day of the eight lunar month of the ancient Indian calendar. That day, Prince Siddhartha is preparing himself to leave the palace. The Pali account claims that when he receives the news of his son's birth he replies, Rahula heto bandhanam jatam, meaning, a Rahu is born, a fetter has arisen, that is, an impediment to the search for enlightenment. Accordingly, Sadodana, Prince Siddhartha's father and king of the Sakya clan, names the child Rahula, because he does not want his son to pursue a spiritual life as a mendicant. In some versions, Prince Siddhartha is the one naming his son this way, for being a hindrance on his spiritual path. Just before the prince leaves the palace for the spiritual life, he takes one look at his wife Yasodhara and his just-born child. Fearing his resolve might waver, Prince Siddhartha resists to hold his son and leaves the palace as he has planned. Rahula therefore becomes Prince Siddhartha's first, but also last and only son. Other traditions Other texts derive Rahu differently. 
For example, the Pali Apadana, as well as another account found in the texts of monastic discipline of the Mulasarvastivada tradition, derive Rahu from the eclipse of the moon, which traditionally was seen to be caused by the Asura demon Rahu. The Apadana states that just like the moon is obstructed from view by Rahu, Prince Siddhartha is obstructed by Rahula's birth. The Mulasarvastivada tradition relates, however, that Rahula is conceived on the evening of the renunciation of Prince Siddhartha, and born six years later, on the day that his father achieves enlightenment, which was during a lunar eclipse. Further credence is given to the astrological theory of Rahula's name by the observation that sons of previous Buddhas are given similar names, related to constellations. Mulasarvastivada and later Chinese texts such as the Abhiniskramana Sutra give two types of explanation for the long gestation period. The first type involves the karma of Princess Yasodhara and Rahula himself. According to this interpretation, Yasodhara has to bear the suffering of carrying a child in her womb for six years, because in a previous life as a cow herder she had refused to help her mother to carry a pail of milk and left it for her mother to carry the extra pail for six leagues. As for Rahula, his karma was that in a previous life as a king he unintentionally had a sage wait for six days. In this life, he was a king and his brother, a previous life of the Buddha, was a hermit who had taken a vow he would only lie from what was given by people. One day, the brother broke his vow to take some water, and feeling guilty, asked the king to punish him. The king refused to issue a punishment for such a trivial matter, but had his brother wait for his final decision and constrained in the royal gardens. After six days, the king suddenly realized he had forgotten about the hermit and immediately set him free, including apologies and gifts. As a result, Rahula had to wait for six years before being born. In some versions, the king did not allow a sage to enter his kingdom and accumulated the same bad karma of a long gestation period. The later Mahayana commentary Mahaprajnaparamitaupadisa Chinese, Da Ji Du Lun Pinyin, Da Zijilin, does not blame Yasodhara's karma for the six years gestation period, but does mention Rahula's same karma as a king. However, in the 13th century Japanese devotional text Ron Koshiki, Rahula's late birth is seen as evidence of a miracle, rather than a result of karma. The second type of explanation consists of the more naturalistic argument that Yasodhara is practicing religious austerities involving fasting and sleeping on a straw bed, which causes Rahula's growth to slow down. She is involved in these practices during the time when Siddhartha is practicing self mortification. Later, King Sadodana prevents Yasodhara from hearing any news of her former husband, and she gradually becomes healthier, as the pregnancy continues normally. However, some time later, the false rumor spreads that the former prince has died of his ascetism. Yasodhara becomes very desperate and depressed, endangering her own pregnancy. When the news reaches the palace that Siddhartha has attained enlightenment, Yasodhara is overjoyed and gives birth to Rahula. Buddhist studies scholar John S. Strong notes that this account draws a parallel between the quest for enlightenment and Yasodhara's path to being a mother, and eventually, they both are accomplished at the same time. The late childbirth leads to doubts in the Sakya clan as to who is the father, as told in the Mulasarvastivada tradition, in the Mahaprajnaparamitaupadisa and in the later Chinese Zabaozang Jing Chinese. Zabao Kang Since Rahula's birth was not regarded by Buddhists to be a virginal or miraculous birth, tradition had to explain that Prince Siddhartha was actually the father. Yasodhara responds by putting her child on a stone in a pond of water and making an act of truth that if Rahula is really her child, that he and the stone may not sink, but rather float back and forth. After she makes the declaration, the child floats according to her vow. Strong notes that this is a symbolic parallel with the attainment of enlightenment by the Buddha, described as the further shore, and coming back to teach humankind. The Mahaprajnaparamitaupadisa contains another account, in which Prince Siddhartha has several wives, and a wife other than Yasodhara is the one defending her, being witness of her innocence. Furthermore, in both the Mulasarvastivada texts and the Mahaprajnaparamitaupadisa, there is a third account that proves Yasodhara's innocence. The Buddha makes everyone around him look identical to him, through a supernatural accomplishment. Rahula proves that the Buddha is his true father when he manages to approach the real Buddha straight away. In a fourth story about proving Yasodhara's purity, appearing in Chinese Avadana-style texts from the 5th century CE onward, she is burnt alive, but miraculously survives. In this account, King Sadodana orders that she be killed by burning her alive as punishment for her alleged impurity. Instead of being hurt by the flames, however, she performs an act of truth and the fire transforms into a pond of water. 
Sadodana welcomes her and her son back into the clan, and later becomes very fond of Rahula. Some Chinese Jatakas say that he recognizes his son Siddhartha in the child, and manages to better cope with the loss of Prince Siddhartha. Religion scholar Reiko Onuma sees the fire ordeal as a metaphor that parallels the Buddha's enlightenment, a similar argument that Strong makes. Historical analysis Historian Wolfgang Schumann hypothesized that Prince Siddhartha conceived Rahula to please his parents, obtain their permission for leaving the palace and becoming a mendicant. He further speculated that the prince only conceived a son thirteen years after his marriage, because Yasodhara initially did not want to bear a child, for fear that the prince would leave the palace and the throne as soon as the child was conceived. Orientalist and missionary Noel Perry believed that a late gestation period was more historically probable than the birth on the same day as in the Pali tradition. She believed that if Prince Siddhartha had left an heir to the throne, there would have been no sound reason for him to leave secretly at night. She further argued that there are many sources that try to explain the long gestation period, indicating an established tradition. Besides historical speculations, Buddhist studies scholar Kate Crosby argues that Prince Siddhartha conceiving or giving birth to a son before his renunciation functions as a motif to prove that he is the best at each possible path in life. After having tried the life of a father to the fullest, he decides to leave it behind for a better alternative. In early Buddhist India, being a father and bearing a son was seen as a spiritual and religious path as well as that of renouncing one's family, and Prince Siddhartha's bringing a son in the world before renunciation proves he is capable of both. Ordination The accounts continue and describe that Rahula is raised by his mother Yasodhara and grandfather King Sadodana. When Rahula is 7, 9 or 15 years old, the Buddha returns to his home city of Kapilavasta at the request of Suddhodana. The Mahavasta text from the Lokottaravada tradition states that the royals try to prevent Rahula from learning about the return of his father, but eventually he insists to know who the great ascetic about to arrive is, and he is told, Indologist Bhikkhu Telwat Rahula sick argues that the child was conscious of being without father. Next, the Mahavasta and the Mulasarvastavada texts relate that Yasodhara tries to tempt the Buddha back into his life as a prince by having Rahula offer the Buddha an aphrodisiac. Mulasarvastavada texts continue and tell that her plan backfires when the Buddha has Rahula eat it himself, and Rahula therefore becomes enamored by his father and wishes to follow him. In the Pali version of the story, on the seventh day of the Buddha's return, Yasodhara takes Rahula to see his father, the Buddha. She tells Rahula that since his father has renounced the palace life and as he is the next royal prince in line, he should ask his father for his inheritance of crown and treasure, for his future sake when his grandfather will no longer rule the kingdom. After the Buddha has had a meal, Rahula follows the Buddha, asking him for his inheritance. The Buddha does not try to prevent Rahula from following him, but in some versions of the story, some women from the court do try to, yet Rahula persists. He then looks at his father and says, Pleasant is your shadow, recluse. Reaching the park of Nigroda, where the Buddha is staying, the Buddha considers that the heritage of the throne will one day perish, and is tied up with suffering and stress. I will give him the wealth I obtained under the tree of enlightenment thus making him the heir of an inheritance that does not perish. Most traditions relate that the Buddha then calls Sariputra and asks him to ordain Rahula. Rahula ordains and is the first Shramanera novice monk, and probably the first person in the monastic order to ordain in a formal way. In some versions of the story, such as the 9th century Chinese Waichingyu Yinyuan Jing Chinese, Wei Senyu Yin Yuan Jing a group of young boys ordained together with him. The king discovers that now his grandson, his son Nanda and a number of other young men in the royal family have ordained and left the palace. Seeing his daughter grieve, he asks the Buddha that from now on, he only ordain people with the consent of his parents. Suddhodana explains that Rahula's ordination was a great shock to him. The Buddha assents to the proposal. This rule is later expanded in the case of women ordaining, as both parents and the husband have to give permission first to allow women to join the order of monks and nuns. In some versions of the story of Rahula's ordination, Yasodhara also protests, but relents in the end. 
The Mahavasta states, however, that Rahula asks to ordain himself, and is eventually granted permission by Yasodhara and Sadodana. Archaeologist Maurizio today has noted that in many Gandharan art depictions, Rahula's life is linked to that of a previous life of the Buddha, the hermit Sumido. The Buddha giving his spiritual heritage to his son is compared to that of Sumido allowing the Buddha Dipamkara to walk over him, which is followed by Dipamkara predicting that Sumido will become a Buddha in a future life. Both the figure of Gautama Buddha giving his inheritance to his son, and the figure of Dipamkara Buddha giving his inheritance of Buddhahood to Sumido are depicted with flames emitting from their bodies. Both scenes are depictions of inheritance, filial and disciple piety. Both may have been considered by 5th century Buddhists to be representations of eager youth. Topic: <inaudible> <inaudible> Enlightenment and Death. According to the Pali texts, once Rahula has become novice, the Buddha teaches Rahula regularly. His instructions are very age-specific, using vivid metaphors and simple explanations. The Buddha's teachings have led to numerous discourses being named after Rahula in the early Buddhist texts. Pali texts relate how Rahula grows up to become a novice that is diligent, dutiful, amenable and eager for learning, but there are also some early medieval Chinese and Japanese accounts which relate that Rahula initially struggles with being a novice and only later appreciates the Buddha's teaching. Besides the Buddha, Sariputra and Magalyana also help to teach Rahula. Rahula often assists Sariputra on his rounds for alms in the morning, and sometimes on other travels. Every morning, Rahula wakes up and throws a handful of sand in the air, making the wish that he may be counseled by good teachers as much as those grains of sand. Still in the same year as Rahula's ordination, the Buddha teaches his son the importance of telling the truth in a discourse known as the Ambalatthika Rahulavada Sutta. In this discourse, the Buddha teaches and encourages consistent self-reflection, to help let go of all evil actions that lead to harm to oneself and others, and to develop self-control and a moral life. He encourages reflection before, during and after one's actions, and explains that lying makes the spiritual life void and empty, leading to many other evils. When Rahula becomes 18 years old, the Buddha instructs Rahula in a meditation technique to counter the desires that hinder him during his tours for alms. Rahula has grown enamored with his own and his father's handsome appearance. To help Rahula, the Buddha teaches another discourse to him. He tells Rahula that all matter is not self, and the same holds for the different parts of one's mental experience. Having heard the discourse, Rahula starts to practice meditation. His teacher Sariputra recommends him to practice breathing meditation, but is unable to give Rahula the instructions he needs. Rahula therefore asks the Buddha to explain the meditation method in more detail and the Buddha responds by describing several meditation techniques to him. On a similar note, the Buddha teaches Rahula at a place called Andavana about the impermanence of all things, and instructs him how to overcome the taints inside the mind. As a result, Rahula attains enlightenment. Pali tradition has it that the sermon is also attended by a crore of heavenly beings, who once had vowed to witness the enlightenment of the son of the Buddha. Rahula obtains the name, Rahula the Lucky. Pali, Rahula Bhada, Sanskrit, Rahula Bhadra, which he himself explains as because of being the son of the Buddha, and because of having attained enlightenment. Later, the Buddha declares that Rahula is foremost among all disciples in eagerness in learning Pali, Sikakamanam, and in the Pali Yudana, the Buddha includes him as one of eleven particularly praiseworthy disciples. Chinese sources add that he is also known for his patience, and that he is foremost in practicing with discretion pinyin, mixing diyi, meaning practicing the Buddha's teaching consistently, dedication to the precepts and study, but without seeking praise or being proud because of being the son of the Buddha. Pali texts give examples of Rahula's strictness in monastic discipline. E.g. after there was a rule established that no novice could sleep in the same room as a fully ordained monk, Rahula is said to have slept in an outdoor toilet. When the Buddha becomes aware of this, he admonishes the monks for not taking proper care of the novices. After that, the Buddha adjusts the rule. Pali texts state that despite Rahula being his son, the Buddha did not particularly favor him. He is said to have loved problematic disciples such as Angulamala and Devadatta as much as his own son, without any bias. Later in Rahula's life, his mother Yasodhara becomes ordained as a nun. In one story, the nun Yasodhara falls ill with flatulence. Rahula helps her recover by asking his teacher Sariputra to find sweetened mango juice for her, which is the medicine she is used to and requires. 
Therefore, with Rahula's help, she eventually recovers. When he is 20 years old, Rahula fully ordains as a monk in Savathi. Rahula's death receives little attention in the earliest sources. Rahula dies before the Buddha and his teacher Sariputra do. According to Pali and Chinese sources, this happens as he is traveling through the second Buddhist heaven Sanskrit, Trayastramsa. According to the early Ekatara Agama Sarvastivada or Mahasangika tradition and the later Sariputrapursha, however, Rahula is one of the four enlightened disciples whom Gautama Buddha asks to prolong their lives to stay in the world until the next Buddha Maitreya has risen, to protect the current Buddha's dispensation. Previous lives Following the Pali and Sanskrit language sources, Rahula is the son of the Buddha to be throughout many lifetimes. He develops his habit of being amenable and easy to teach in previous lives. Pali texts explain that in a previous life he was impressed by the son of a previous Buddha, and vowed to be like him in a future life. Legacy. Texts in the Mahayana tradition describe that Rahula is the eleventh of the sixteen elders Sanskrit, Sotasasthavira. Chinese tradition added two elders in the 10th century, making for eighteen elders, enlightened disciples that have been entrusted with taking care of the Buddha's dispensation until the rising of Maitreya Buddha. Tradition states therefore that Rahula is still alive, and resides with 1,100 of his pupils in an island called the Land of Chestnuts and Grains Chinese, Bai Li Yang Ku Zhou Pinyin, Biliang Chu Zhou. The pilgrim Zan Zhang heard a Brahmin claim that he met Rahula as an old man, who had delayed his passing into Nirvana and was therefore still alive. On a similar note, Rahula is considered one of the ten principal disciples, known for his dedication to training new monks and novices. Moreover, he is considered to be one of the 23-28 masters in the lineage of the Tiantai tradition, one of the 28 in the Chan lineage, and one of the eight enlightened disciples in the Burmese tradition, as one of the enlightened disciples responsible for protecting the Buddha's dispensation. Rahula has often been depicted in East Asian art. He is depicted with a large, umbrella-shaped Head, prominent eyes, and a hooked nose. The Chinese monks Zan Zhang and Faxian (c.320 to 420 CE) noted during their pilgrimages in India that a cult existed that worshipped Rahula, especially in the Madura area. Whereas monks would worship certain early male disciples following their particular specialization, and nuns would honor Ananda in gratitude for helping to set up the nuns' order, novices would worship Rahula. The two Chinese pilgrims noted that Emperor Ahsoka built a monument in honor of Rahula, especially meant for novices to pay their respects. Religious studies scholar Lori Meeks points out with regard to Japan, however, that Rahula was not the individual object of any devotional cult, but was rather honored as part of a group of enlightened disciples, such as the Sixteen Elders. Exception to this was the 13th-14th century, when the figure of Rahula became an important part of a revival of devotion to early Buddhist disciples among the old Nara schools, as chanted lectures Koshiki rites, and images were used in dedication to Rahula. On regular days of religious observance, male and female novices performed rites and gave lectures in honor of Rahula. These were popular with the laypeople, as well as with priests that aimed to revive early Buddhist monastic discipline. In the Koshiki Rahula was praised extensively, and was described as the eldest child, eldest being a devotional term, since Prince Siddhartha had no other children. The Lotus Sutra, as well as later East Asian texts such as the Ran Koshiki, relate that Gautama Buddha predicts Rahula will become a Buddha in a future life, named Stepping on Seven Treasure Flowers, Sanskrit, Saptarat Napadmavikrama. In these texts, Rahula was seen as a Mahayana type of Buddha to be, who would save many sentient beings and live in a pure land. The exhortations the Buddha gives to Rahula have also become part of his legacy. The Ambalatthika Rahulavada Sutta became one of the seven Buddhist texts recommended for study in the inscriptions of the Emperor Asoka. This discourse has been raised by modern ethicists as evidence for consequentialist ethics in Buddhism, though this is disputed. Rahula is mentioned as one of the founders of a system of Buddhist philosophy called the Vebasika, which was part of the Sarvastivada schools. He is also considered by some Thai schools of Buddhist Boran meditation to be the patron of their tradition, which is explained by referring to Rahula's gradual development in meditation as opposed to the instant enlightenment of other disciples.
Topic: <laughs> Childhood in Buddhism. From the narratives surrounding Rahula several conclusions have been drawn with regard to Buddhist perspectives on childhood. Several scholars have raised Rahula's example to indicate that children in Buddhism are seen as an obstacle to spiritual enlightenment, or that Buddhism, being a monastic religion, is not interested in children. Education scholar Yoshiharu Nakagawa argues, however, that Rahula's story points at two ideals of childhood which exist parallel in Buddhism, that of the common child, subject to the human condition, and that of the child with a potential for enlightenment, who Crosby describes as a heroic disciple. Religion scholar Vanessa Sasson notes that although Prince Siddhartha initially abandons his son, he comes back for him and offers a spiritual heritage to him as opposed to a material one. This heritage is given from a viewpoint of trust in the potential of the child Rahula, presuming that the Buddhist path can also be accessed by children. The acceptance of Rahula in the monastic order as a child set a precedent, which later developed into a widespread Buddhist tradition of educating children in monasteries. The numerous teachings given to Rahula have left behind teaching material which could be used for teaching children of different ages, and were sophisticated for the time period. Theravada tradition further built on this genre, with Pali manuals of religious teaching for novices. <laughs> Notes <laughs> Citations <laughs>